Good morning. Good morning. Very nice to be here with you again. And good to see you all for the service of worship. Uh, there's one or two notices on the back of the service sheets, but I think you'll know them all before without my saying much about them. Except to note that on the last Sunday of each month till June, uh, the church and scheme will be here with us, and that will be a joint service in anticipation of the coming union with scheme. Tea and coffee after the service, I invite you to join us there for an extension to the worship and a time of fellowship one with another. We worship God, singing in hymn 113, God the Father of creation, source of life and energy. If there's not a place where tears can flow, 
Where do we take our sorrow and our grief? If there's not a place where sins are forgiven, where do we go with our shame and our wrongs? Lord Jesus Christ, you are that place. The place where all hearts can be opened, all truth can be uttered, all stories can be told, and all hearts can be healed. So we come to you holding nothing back, opening hand and heart to receive all that you wish to give us, that we might yet become the people you mean us to be, and live as you wish us to live. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. Speak to us now in the stillness of this holy place. For we who follow you would hear what you would say to us and do what you require of us by promoting justice, loving mercy and walking humbly with you today and all the days of our lives. So may it be, O God, for we ask this prayer in Jesus' name, as he saw, as he say the words he taught his friends to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for forever. Amen. <clears throat> we read first in the Old Testament this morning in the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, from verse 1. Listen to what this is saying to us. The Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country, your family, and your relatives, and go to the land that I will show you. I will bless you and make your descendants into a great nation. You will become famous and be a blessing to others. I will bless anyone who blesses you, but I will put a curse on anyone who puts a curse on you. Everyone on earth will be blessed because of you. Abraham was 75 years old when the Lord told him to leave the city of Ham. He obeyed and left with his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions and slaves they had while in Ham. And we turn to the New Testament, to the Gospel according to St. John. And there at chapter 3, reading from verse 1. There was a man named Nicodemus who was a Pharisee and a Jewish leader. One night he went to Jesus and said, So we know that God has sent you to teach us. You could not perform these miracles unless God were with you. Jesus replied, I tell you for certain that you must be born from above before you can see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus asked, how can a grown man ever be born a second time? Jesus answered, I tell you for certain that before you can get into God's kingdom, you must be born not only by water, but by the Spirit. Humans give life to their children, yet only God's Spirit can change you into a child of God. Don't be surprised when I say that you must be born from above. Only God's Spirit gives new life. The Spirit is like the wind that blows wherever it wants to go. You can hear the wind, but you don't know where it comes from, and you don't know where it is going. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, How can you be a teacher of Israel and not know these things? I tell you for certain that we know what we're talking about 
because we have seen it ourselves. But none of you will accept what we say. If you don't believe me when I talk to you about things on earth, how can you possibly believe if I talk to you about things in heaven? No one has gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from the earth. And the Son of Man must be lifted up, just as the metal snake was lifted up by Moses in the desert. Then everyone who has faith in the Son of Man will have eternal life. God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn its people, he sent him to save them. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word and to his name be the glory and the praise. In 502, take my life, Lord, let it be. Egypt, 
We are told that he married a woman called Asenath, and he had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And we're told also what these words mean, because they refer to Joseph's life experience. Manasseh means God has made me forget. God has made me forget all my troubles with my own family back in Canaan. And Ephraim means God has made me fruitful. Thanks be to God, who by his grace has changed my circumstances. I now have a family and I have risen to where I am today. It's true also of the baby born in Bethlehem in Matthew's Gospel. Father Joseph is told to call the boy Jesus because Jesus means God saves. And Jesus says the story will save his people from their sins. Which brings us neatly to the name of the man in our story this morning. Nicodemus. The story doesn't tell us what his name means, but it's very, very easy to work that out. Because it comes from two words in Greek, Nike and Demos. And Nike, as we know from the sportswear manufacturer, means victory. They use Nike as their symbol with the big arrow to say that if you use our equipment, you will be a winner. And Demos is the word from which we get our word democracy. It simply means of the people. So Nicodemus is the victor over the people. And what we are told about him in the story would seem to support that. We are told that he was a Pharisee. And Pharisee means the separated ones, the people who are separated by their devotion and their commitment to keeping the Jewish law in all its aspects. So, Nicodemus has that to his name. But we're also told that he was a member of the Jewish council. The Jewish council was called the Sanhedrin and it contained 70 men who were responsible for the oversight of the running of the temple as well as for encouraging people to keep the Jewish law in all its aspects. They also had a political function they were the final course of appeal and they often took part in cases in both the criminal and the civil courts. So Nicodemus is a big hitter. He's one of the good and the great of Jerusalem. He's a very prominent man and he comes to Jesus. John tells us one or two things about that coming. He says that he came to Jesus by night. And that, as often in John's Gospel, is symbolic. Night is simple, a symbol of darkness, a way of saying that Nicodemus was in the darkness about Jesus. And we're told that he doesn't come to Jesus just for himself because he says to Jesus we know and Jesus replies to him you in the plural so we might assume he's there on behalf of the Sanhedrin and he's there because he wants to find out about this Jesus because immediately before this in John's Gospel, John has told the story about the cleansing of the temple. When Jesus went into the temple precincts and he cleared out the money changers and the dealers and the animals that were needed for the sacrifice, 
And in John's Gospel, and only in John's Gospel, he says he did that with a whip. So Nicodemus wants to know, who is this guy? What is he about? What authority does he have to do all this? And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you're a man of some distinction because you couldn't do all these miracles if you weren't. We don't know whether he was being sincere, whether he was being sarcastic, or whether he was being patronizing. The story doesn't tell us. But Jesus says, unless you're born again, or born from above, there's a whole issue of how you translate the word. Unless you're born from above, as was read in your translation of the Bible today, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. But what does that mean? Many translations of the New Testament render that as born again. And we know from our experience that born again in current language referred to a particular kind of Christianity. In general, we could say it refers to people who take the Bible pretty literally. It refers to people who can point to a date and time when they were converted to Christian faith. It's often associated with people who think that abortion is the same as murder, who think that homosexuality is a sin. Also associated with people who are quite happy to go to war because in America in 2003, when the country went to war with Iraq, the biggest single group that supported the war were what were known as white, born again Christian people. I think the translation you're using is much better. It says that unless you're born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And above and below in John's Gospel, as often is the case, I say, are symbolic words. It just doesn't mean up or down. Above is the realm where love is pervasive. In the realm of above, the ruling characteristics are generosity, inclusiveness, kindness, compassion, forgiveness. In the realm of below, the ruling characteristic is me, mine, what I want, what will benefit me, regardless of what adverse effect that might have on other people. And in John's construct of the gospel, he says that Jesus comes from the level of above, down to the level of below, to lift us to his level. So the gospel in John, the gospel in John's understanding is that we must be lifted up to the realm of above by God's Spirit. And I think that involves three things for us. It recognises that being born from above is not a one-off. It is a continuous process. Because we are constantly being drawn away from the things of God by the things of this world. One of the most interesting characters for me in the New Testament is a man called Demas, not Demas, D-E-M-E-S. And he's mentioned only three times. The first time he's mentioned as a companion of Luke. Second time he's mentioned as a fellow worker with Paul. And the third time he's mentioned, we're told that he has left the cause because he was taken by the attractions of the world. 
And that is always an issue for us. We are always tempted to be drawn away from the values of faith and the standards of faith by the things of this world. So people say it's all right if you can get away with it. We are subjected now to a society where nobody trusts the politicians because we don't think they tell us the truth. And that is always a temptation for people of faith to be drawn away from the values of truth and justice and righteousness. And so being exposed to the Spirit of God in Jesus is an ongoing process. We need to be born from above day by day by day so that we don't end up like Demas who deserted the cause because he was drawn to the values of the world. And the second is we do this by staying with the story of Jesus. If we stay with the story of Jesus, we are constantly drawn back and back into again and again the values of faith. What faith requires of us. What faith asks of us. And what faith gives to us. The Spirit of God is given to us in the story of Jesus. And the third thing I think is that we need to remain part of the community of faith where the story of Jesus is told and retold and told again. Because it's within the community that we get the support of other people. And we need the support of other people to keep us on the right track. Unless you're born from above, says John to Jesus, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that's only possible by our exposure to the Spirit of God. The Spirit, says John, in the story goes when it goes. But we believe essentially it goes to us through the story of Jesus and the community that keeps rehearsing the story and telling it over and over again. May that be true for you and me. Amen and may God bless to us this word preached in his name and to his name be the glory and the praise. In 616 there's a spirit in the air
Let us pray. You are the first and the last and the living one, O God. You made your purposes of love and justice known in the beginning. And these purposes must prevail in the end. Then swords will be turned into plowshares, and spears into pruning knives, and people will study war no more. Then there will be neither hurt nor harm, and no more crying of tears because of man's inhumanity to man. As we thank you for this vision of what is yet to be, we commit ourselves to live tomorrow's life today, the life of faith that will one day cover the waters of the sea and the lands of the earth, and we work and pray for its coming. We remember today all who live with the legacy of violence and cruelty in Israel, Palestine, in Ukraine and Russia, in Yemen, Iraq and Afghanistan, and pray that the worst experience in these places does not crush or destroy the human spirit of goodness and generosity. May what is possible in the future not be limited by what has gone in the past. Lead people away from living and dying in storms of hate and gusts of violence. But let them be drawn rather to the light of reconciliation and peace. We ask your blessing on the peacemakers of our world. Those who go the extra mile to prevent people doing their worst. And to help them overcome division and hostility. Bless the work of the United Nations, the European Court of Justice, the International Council for Human Rights, and all who stand up for the victims of injustice and wrong. And bless the work of aid agencies who help people cope with tragedy and disaster, provide relief in times of emergency, and help others develop life skills for a better future. May they never weary of well-doing and never yield to despair. Now in the quietness of the morning, we remember those known to us personally who need our prayers because they are ill or anxious or facing hardship or struggling to cope in these hard times. May they be aware of our concern for their well-being, conscious of our support, and know the peace of your presence with them. Hear us as we name them now in the silence. Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In 622 is sing, we sing a love that sets all people free. <laughs>